Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Doe, and I'm a product marketing director here at Equifax for our risk portfolio. Today's episode is a follow-up to our conversation from our Market Pulse webinar on February 16th, where we focused on growth in an uncertain market. Patrick Riley, co-founder at Uplink Financial Technologies, was our featured guest, and he joins us again today for a deeper dive on how data can help lenders grow in an uncertain market. Before we begin, let's set the stage with a short economic update from David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. We're nearing a moment of truth for this business cycle. Uh, Will the economy suffer a recession or will it be able to skirt one? Uh, Barring an unforeseen shock, uh, the the answer is ultimately going to rest on whether consumers, businesses, and lenders lose faith in the economy and stop spending, investing, and lending. So far, consumers have not lost faith, but they are wavering. Uh, We look at the University of Michigan survey, and in the last 70 years, rarely has there been a moment where consumers were as uh, soured on the economy as they are today. Uh, There there have been moments where it's worse, but it's it's pretty, the sentiment's pretty poor right now. Uh, Small businesses uh, have been on edge. uh, There's a 50-year survey from the National Federation of Independent Businesses, uh, and respondents are especially down in the economy's prospects later this year. Lenders are, are have turned skittish as well. The Federal Reserve's quarterly survey of senior loan officers uh, has showed that commercial banks have rapidly tightened their underwriting standards, and, and this has been across the board. Uh, consumer categories, uh, banks, mortgages, credit cards, personal loans, they've all shown tightening, and then we've seen uh, a lot of tightening on the commercial real estate side and commercial industrial loan loans as well. So uh, so really, there's been a lot of tightening that's happening on the, from lenders. Uh, and uh, and there's good reason for all the frayed nerves. Uh, inflation remains painfully high. Uh, the typical American family is forced to shell out almost $400 more per month to buy the same goods and services it did just a year ago. Leading uh, indicators, economists often rely on to signal a recession, uh, are also showing in flashing warning signs, the treasury yield uh, with short-term yields rising above long-term yields inverted about a year ago uh, and so so that's made a lot of economists nervous so, uh, but we would like to argue that this time is a little bit different uh, and i know that's easy to say that this time is different but let me give you some reasons why this might be different consumers have been able to build up a substantial amount of excess savings during the uh, the height of the pandemic so that's uh, something that's in the economy's favor also job growth is slowing uh, and it's not because of more layoffs, but it's because businesses are throttling back on hiring, which is down to where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, and, and there's also a, f- a fair number of unfilled positions as workers still are quitting their jobs. It's just taking a, it's just taking a little bit more time to find that new position. Uh, the financial system is also has never been really on firmer grounds. The regulatory overhaul in the wake of the financial crisis, the, the 2010 Dodd Frank. Uh, legislation has really ensured that the financial system is on firm ground. Uh, banks have been required to hold more capital, engage in annual stress tests, uh, and have more liquid balance sheets. And even non-banks have regulations that they need to abide, abide by as well. So financial systems in good shape. Uh, and then if, if we look at past business cycles, when we've seen the economy was struggling with similar problems of inflation uh, and high and rising interest rates, there has always been a, a, lo- a collective loss of faith. And, and then really the recession um, ensued. This time, we think it's different enough that this should not happen. Uh, uh, you know, every economist has odds f- for the chance of a recession. And we've actually lowered our odds of a recession from 50% down to 45. It's, it's a very modest change, but hopefully it's one that's in the, in the right direction. And our baseline, which is our most likely outlook, has been recession-free throughout this uncertain time. Uh, and, and we're increasingly confident that the uh, recession-free outcome will happen. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty out there still. So we have to see how the economy plays out in the next uh, throughout this year really and and whether we can hopefully avoid a recession i 
Okay, thanks, David. Patrick, we're so happy to have you back with us today. Catherine, it's really great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So your company, Uplick Financial Technologies, helps small business owners gain access to credit globally. Can you tell us briefly why you started the company and, and maybe give us your elevator pitch and, and how you assist small businesses? Hey, you know, probably a great way to begin is to really explain, you know, the, the World Bank calls small business lending the missing metal. Uh, what, what do they mean by that? Um, you know, if you think about the consumer space, it's highly evolved. It's been going a long time. It's really efficient. I'm not saying that everybody gets served perfectly well through the process, but it really does a great job with a large percentage of the population. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the commercial lending space, the corporate lending space where people have loan officers and people have relationship representatives. And it's like getting a, you know, a tailor made suit. Everything is custom made and custom fitted to you to make sure the experience is great. Now you have the missing metal and we call it the missing middle because there's this challenge here, right? It has a lot of the complexity of larger institutions, larger businesses, but not the loan sizes of the efficiencies that allow us to meet that need well. So how big does that missing middle end up being? Experts measure just within the U.S. that the unmet loan need in the small business space is somewhere between about $600 billion annually to upwards of approximately $1 trillion annually. So it's a huge issue. And if you think about it, um, this is a space for most banks where some of the widest margins exist. In other words, there's a lot of opportunity for profitability if you know how to underwrite it well. But just as important, if you think about what would happen if you could put that $6 billion, $600 billion into the, the marketplace, that creates jobs. It creates tens of millions of jobs. And equally important, the small business space is really the incubator of intellectual property, of commercial innovation. And so when, when we get this right, really what we're doing is we're, we're not only doing something great for lenders, we're not only doing something great for borrowers, but we're actually doing something great for the economy. So we all win in the process when we, when we do this well. But you ask, you know, sort of how do we help? What do we do? And so Uplink connects to over 10,000 authoritative data sources that end up accumulating to be something like, well, in the U.S. alone, about uh, 12 and a half billion different data series. And these are things that help us understand who the customer is, the potential borrower, the marketplace in which they exist. Uh, and from that, what we're able to actually do then is build very powerful models that describe the customer within the environment they serve so we can better predict risk behavior, we can better predict financial performance behavior, and we can better position loan product solutions to those individuals. And so uh, that is uh, kind of in a nutshell what we do. Uh, what's our experience base? With over 1.4 trillion in underwriting experience, Uplink has tremendous expertise and working with regulated lenders. I, I personally have about 30 years of experience working in big bank space within the U.S. And just as Equifax has, has to hit really high regulatory standards, most of their customers do as well. And that means being able to deliver a solution that only not only performs well, but also satisfies things like Basel III, SR11-7, IFRS9, stress testing capability. You have to be able to show you can meet safety and soundness standards. You can meet fairness standards. You can actually deliver something that fits within real world space. And that's exactly what we do. We deliver white box reviewable solutions, but in an ultra efficient way, an ultra high performance way. Well, thank you, Patrick. You're certainly an expert and great person to have for this conversation today. And so we, we did cover a lot in our February webinar. And a few of the takeaways I got or, or highlights were that this is indeed an uncertain economy that we're in. The number of new small businesses has soared. And for lenders, there is still opportunity across the board. So, and I know that was one of your, your points that I made last can you explain a little bit further for our listeners how the financial industry can find that opportunity that, I guess, lies across the board? You know, if, for the people listening, I don't know if anybody really remembers 
the credit card industry of the 1990s. Maybe I'm, I'm getting too old. But, um, you know, it was a one set. We've got listeners of all ages, so please, we'd love to hear it. Absolutely. You know, uh, in the early 90s, it was a one-size-fits-all kind of vanilla product. There was an interest rate. You know, maybe there was gold in, in standard, uh, but really that's what it was. And and the reality of that was over really just a few years, there was this huge transition to risk-based pricing, balance transfers, dynamic line assignments, all sorts of things that fundamentally changed and made that product competitive. Well, what happened in that process is those people who got it right, you know, there were about, oh, there were thousands of issuers at that point in time, and thousands of issuers collapsed to hundreds, and really within just a few years, really reduced down to a few dozen that dominated the category. And what I would say about that was interesting was sometimes when you see that happening, the market doesn't really grow. There's just a grab for existing share. But in this case, the market was actually expanding really fast as well. Well, I would argue that we're really at the same point in small business right now, where there is an opportunity for those people who can understand how to lend more effectively, going back to that 600 billion, 1 trillion unmet need. Those who figure out how to do that have an enormous opportunity. And so if we think about uh, getting directly to your question, how do we reach people of any size, of any business age, any industry category, any market location, uh, serve, whatever the circumstances is and whatever fits into your credit purview, how do we, how do we really make that work? And I would say that probably the big gap right now is most traditional lenders tend to use a, what I would call a decision tree type approach. And so it's a whole collection of yes, no's. You're kind of passing through a gauntlet is a loan applicant. And as long as you keep hitting yeses, you can get all the way through the other end. But if any point along the way you hit a no, you're out. Well, what's the problem with a system like that? You know, as a math guy, I can tell you the problem with a system like that is what you're going to have to do is say no to a lot of really good people in order to get to the portion that is reliably good for you. So if you can use a more dynamic method where you can balance the positives and the negatives to arrive at a conclusion, what you're actually able to do is say yes a lot more often. If you think about it in the unregulated space, even in some of the riskiest lending areas of commercial lending, the loss rates are rarely above about 20%. That means 80% of those customers are still great credit customers for a bank. And so if what, what we can do is manufacture a process to reach those segments, and we do that with multivariate modeling. We use it balancing the positives and the negatives to arrive at a view of what we should do. I know we've talked about data and using more data and more unique data. And so in, in your business, what do you define or consider unique data? Well, I think really importantly, you know, as we touched uh, a large part of our audience, a large part of Equifax's audience is regulated space. Not everybody's regulated, but it's regulated space. And so the first thing I want to underscore is that we rely on authoritative sources, uh, sources that can be uh, trusted and underscored. So as an example, we're not looking at opinions on Facebook or Twitter feeds or other type of information like that. It would be great if we could, but the problem is a lot of that information is too easy to gain. It's too easy to trash somebody or it's too easy to cook your own numbers to produce results. And so what we really do is look at sources that can be well vetted, well authenticated, that we can have high confidence in. So what are we talking about? Things like uh, bank account data transactional and statement information, billing information, government sources, uh, utility reporting, and other sorts of similar sources of information that can give us high confidence about what's going on. I think some quick examples of that would include things like location-specific aggregated mobile device activity. So wh what are we talking about? You're watching all those cars go up and down the road. I wish they aren't, weren't all using their cell phones, but the reality is most are in one form or another. And we don't have to know who's going up and down the street. That's really not important to us. But to understand the volume of traffic that moves in front of a storefront can be incredibly informative about the likelihood of success of that restaurant or that shopkeeper or that business. So now we're not just dependent on government data 
that tells us where people live and where they work, we can actually see the river they flow down when they're going between all their points in life. Uh, another great example is peer tax return information. We can actually aggregate together peer groups that are reflective of the type of business we're looking at. And so we can adjust for the age of the business and the size of the business and the marketplace the business exists in and so on and so forth to arrive at a view of how well is this company performing relative to its peer group? We went through COVID. Did they appear to be more resilient or less resilient than their competition? And when we see these things, we can see creativity, ingenuity, the ability to be resourceful, even before they've even had an opportunity to actually borrow. And that can be really informative. Another example I would give would be residential and commercial vacancy data. The U.S. Postal Service collects information. This tells us a lot about what's happening in a community before prices inflect. And the final piece I would give as an example is utility payment information. This is an area where Equifax has excellent information and is really a leader in the space. I can look at the energy that people are consuming and understand how that correlates back to their book. The other thing I can do is I can actually look at how they're paying those bills. All that gives me a view into the customer before maybe they even have a borrowing relationship. You mentioned several examples there, restaurants, shopkeepers. Are there any industries that you think in terms of opportunity that would be better to focus on than others? And does location matter? I think, you know, uh, the first answer, so uh, yes and yes, but maybe even more importantly, um, if you think about it, 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 you know, if we if we just all visualize right now and say, uh, where's the perfect location for a convenience store gas station? And then ask yourself, would that be the perfect location for a fine dining restaurant? And nine times out of the 10, the answer is going to be no. So it's not only good location and bad location or good industry category, bad industry category. It's a lot about fitment. And in geek speak, we talk about interactions between data. And so when we're looking, we're not only looking for saying, is this community growing? Is it contracting? Is it a resource-rich environment for this type of business to, to build within, but also fit? How well does it fit? And so as you think about this types of interactions, you can think about the business type and the location in that example. But now we can think about industry experience and owner expertise as an example. We can also think about uh, cash liquidity and the income statement volatility that exists, right? So we don't have to have hard cuts for how much cash they have. What we can actually look at and say, how much volatility is there and how much cash are they keeping on hand? And now we have a very informed view about sufficiency within the system. So I, I think you get the idea with that. But those kind of interactions extend all throughout the space. And so when we do a better job of modeling, we're actually looking and saying, how does A influence B and B influence A? And so from a, a credit scoring perspective, I believe you said and told us on our webinar that things like employment data or employment in general may be less important than factors like revenue flow and volatility and income, you know, building on what you just mentioned. And why do you think that is? We don't do a lot on, uh, you know, what we really do is we try and be very scientifically based. And so you could imagine if I go back to that view of saying we're pulling in 12 and a half billion pieces of data. And now what we want to do is we're going to go through a process where we look across an entire 12 and a half billion and say, what of this best explains credit risk? Specifically, the likelihood that this loan is going to get repaid. And, and so now what we begin to do is we begin to assemble that data. Now, what I will say about the employment information, and this is very important in small business space, oftentimes we don't have all the data we need. If I don't have that income data, and I don't have that expense data, the employment data may be really important. And, and so there's a hierarchy there. And how we reach to different pieces of data, depending on what information I do have, is probably the more complete response to that. So employment data can be important. It's just not as valuable if I have those other pieces of information. But we, we determine that scientifically. In the model development and building process, it is going to go through and select the data that it best explains credit risk. And so thinking more about employment, companies are struggling to find workers right now. 
I think we're probably all experiencing that in our, our various communities. What do you think the financial industry can do to perhaps turn that around for the economy and for our communities, and, and how so? I think it's a huge opportunity. And, I, you know, sometimes I sort of envision, uh, you know, a banker uh, with, their, with their child, and, uh, and they say, you know, mommy, you know, what do you do for a living? And you could imagine if, if that, if that banker were to be able to look back at that child and say, you know what I do? We empower businesses to grow and we grow the economy. That's what I do. That'd be a pretty cool answer, right? That'd be a pretty awesome answer. That's a realistic answer. It's an honest answer. It can be an honest answer anyway. And so I guess what I would say is, is that if we go back to that 600 billion, that potentially trillion dollar amount, you know, I started my career as an economist, and as economists, we would look and say, if we put that capital into the marketplace, how many jobs does that create? And when we look at it, we know that jobs create jobs, right? If I'm running a business and I hire people and they do something, it enables other people to do things. What it ends up meaning is really tens of millions of jobs can be created by solving this problem effectively. So it's a big deal. It's a really exciting deal. I mean, I would love that every banker could look at their kid and say, I help this world grow in a better way. That would be pretty awesome. Yeah, very awesome. So if we think a little bit further into the future, say five to 10 years out, what sort of trends do you see shaping the future of small business or, or maybe small business lending? Well, I, you know, I'll first answer the, the piece on small business. And uh, I think we were all sort of taken aback at how easily the world transitioned from heading into the office every day to being able to function from home a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, what we did see too is this rapid ballooning of uh, businesses because if, if I'm not spending, you know, 40 hours uh, a day or 40 hours a week in the office and then plus my commute time and so on and so forth, this idea of saying, I'm going to stand up a little small business and see where it goes. And I can, I don't have to do this in tightrope fashion anymore. I can have the safety net of employment and kind of make something work and see if I can grow something. I think we've absolutely seen that in the, in the ballooning of business. But I think importantly, the, the other reason why that's possible is there the tool set on the internet now to let anybody step into entrepreneurship has probably never been better, right? The ability to say, here are these great accounting tools. Here's this ability to reach the internet. The kind of podcasting things that we're doing right now have really uh, created an opportunity where the small can play big. I think that means businesses stand up faster. And if you're a lender, and this kind of gets to the second part of your question, you need to react much more quickly, right? In other words, the transition from here's an idea to let me translate it into a successful business happens quickly. And, and so a part of how that translates for us as an example is we have lots of lenders now that we're taking a couple of months to make a credit decision that now actually fund through loans in a matter of minutes. And because they realize that that's the standard that they have to satisfy. And so I think for banks, what it means, I think for lenders of all types, what it means is really making that process more efficient, more user-friendly, um, taking advantage of all the resources that are out there to make good decisions and moving to a more automated approach to deliver solution. Is there anything we didn't touch on or any final bits of, of wisdom you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's not so long ago that, that banks had the luxury of taking weeks to make a decision. You know, if anybody's ever gone through an SBA process, it's absolutely miserable. But uh, today, we're really, uh, Uplink is providing tools that streamline this process, can handle it in a regulatory manner, can actually take advantage of bringing together all this data and and utilizing it in a way to make a great uh, decision. I think um, uh, winning banks around the world are learning how to sort of let go of 30-year-old underwriting practice and really step into a, a modern view, something a lot more consistent with what we see on the consumer side of the fence. So um, what I would urge banks to do is look and say, how do we bring real science to our underwriting practice? Right? How do we how do we really um, take a look at this through a fresh set of eyes? And yes, we need to absolutely uphold 
safety, soundness, fairness, you know, uh, loan loss provisioning, stress testing, all these things that we're going to be held accountable for. But when you're building a solution well, you can actually bake that in to a great business decision. And, and therefore, there, there's no headroom associated with that. There's no, there's no burden associated with delivering that stuff. And there's high confidence that it's going to be done. It's no longer dependent on whether I'm paying attention or the dog bit me, whether I'm having a good day or a bad day. But suddenly we get a lot of stability around that. So, uh, that is, um, uh, kind of in a nutshell, uh, what I would, uh, you know, what I would just encourage lenders to do is look for solutions that help them get past that, uh, sort of antiquated technology. And uh, probably the last thing I would say is I really thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I really want to encourage banks to go for it, uh, lenders of all kinds go for it. And um, I think Equifax has been a leader from very early on. We talked about that uh, uh, utility data and uh, all the stuff they did in small business, uh, you know, really now for, for decades. I thank you for that as well. It's uh, It's been great. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the kind words and certainly all the sound insight that you've provided us today. For our listeners, I'm going to paint a, a picture here for you. And you you shared with us that you are a math guy. You shared about geek speak. For, <laughs> for our listeners can't see on Patrick's, his, his background is a large whiteboard with what looks like a very complicated equation, something along the lines of the movie Goodwill Hunting. Yes, Goodwill Hunting. And, you know, Matt Damon walks behind the board and he solves that math problem. So that's what I'm looking at as I speak with Patrick right now. And I just can't help but ask, is that an actual equation you've got back there, or is this a prop? This is 100% real, so I can just ledge a little off right there for you if that helps. Yes, yes, <laughs> I love it. Well, you've sold me on your credibility in joining us today. So thank you again, Patrick. And if our listeners would like to know more about you or Uplink Financial Technologies, please visit uplink.co. That's U-P-L-I-N-Q dot co. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please share a review and subscribe. If you'd like to send us any questions or suggested topics for the future, you can email us at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. And don't forget to register for our Market Pulse webinar series at equifax.com forward slash Market Pulse. You'll get relevant economic and credit insights to help your business make more confident decisions. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.